I think the lesson he taught me and and uh, is just to what you mentioned about the the hard school of life. Yeah. It, it was I think the biggest lesson was to endure and to push through and to persist. Uh, too many people, I see it a lot. Uh, you just give up. It's a bit too hard. Uh, you know what? This is not for me. Um, so I think one of the biggest lesson lessons uh, was your know, persistence. Uh, yeah, persevering. Hi, Nick. It's so lovely to meet you here on Zoom. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the privilege. All the way in Wellington, South Africa, um, and you're in Austria, so it's amazing the technology. But thank you for thinking of us. Yeah, it's uh, well. I know your shoes and and uh, the shoe business that your dad started in Wellington. Mm. Um, and uh, I would love to know more about the the whole story behind the shoemaking and how he started and how you got involved. So first of all, I want to know about the name of your business, Redemption. Yes, um, I'll always try and be brief because uh, every story has a long story or a long version and a short mm -hmm. version. But the name Redemption actually started in 1976 um, with a guy called Andre Willifier. So he actually started the business. And in the 70s, I was born in the 70s, but it was very... Um, Still a bit hippie, um, long hair, long beard, handmade products, handmade jewelry, handmade footwear, belts, etc. So it was quite a um, fashionable thing. And uh, obviously, you had the platforms, etc. So my dad saw uh, this guy in Cape Town in the shoes, and he was very much uh, intrigued and interested by this guy's uh, gift. And uh, so the name uh, actually was Andre's doing. Uh, there's a lovely, you can be, it's two angels in the logo uh, playing instruments. So it uh, does have a bit of a spiritual connection because Andre used to be involved in um, drug addictions and he got uh, sort of delivered from that or got out of that and then uh, as as a, as a believer as a christian he realized he wanted a, a hobby and he started to do leather work to keep him you know out of the addictive uh uh you know, attitude so that helped him a lot and that the whole redemption being redeemed out of drugs if you want to you give it a spiritual connection but i asked him uh wow about 15 years ago um he must tell me his version. That's now Andre. And Andre said, other than that, he, the word redemption uh, around Cape Town at that time was just a very word like cool or spiff or kiff. Or, it was just a very fashionable oh. word, mm -hmm. redemption. You know, I don't know. So that was his version. And uh, yeah, so two stories, the one spiritual and the one just being a, a nice word, redemption. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's about that's so wonderful. I mean, this is an, an, a story of you know somebody doing something creative to get himself on you know out of an addiction. That's also yes. so interesting. Yeah. Yes. So then, uh, your dad, how, what made him interested in these shoes? Mm. Yeah. So he has a a very interesting story, and I'm sure. He would have loved to tell you, so I'll try and give, give you the short version. But uh, he grew up uh, as um, the youngest of five children uh, in our neighboring town of Paul. Uh, he's always had a bit of an entrepreneurial uh, inclination. He always wanted to sell things, buy things, wheel and deal. Um, and from a very young age, he already met an elderly guy called Yapi. Um, and um, Yapi taught him how to plait whips and, you know, how to uh, pre prepare um, leather hides, etc. My dad uh, watched Bushman videos or Bushman uh, movies or documentaries, and he was intrigued by the whole thing of making leather products um bow and arrow anything you know to be outside in the bush so i think from a, a very young age he, he has always been intrigued by uh, um, handmade leather products so his whole family was in the police force 
He also then joined after school, but amongst you know all the police activities, he all, always tried to make time to make leather hats and sell it to his police friends. Uh, mm -hmm. He would make holsters for the guns and he would sell it to his police friends. So he's always had this, always busy with leather work, uh, trying to make extra money. He had um, my sister and I uh, very early after uh, his school career, he got married after school and my sister and I were born pretty much after that. So uh, yeah, he needed extra, cash you know <laughs> so the leather work has always been an extra income for him and uh, in this time he met Andre uh, Ulifir and he was Andre never really allowed him to in his factory uh, but he spent a lot of time with him and uh, to end the story uh, around 1983 uh, Andre sold the business to my dad and then my dad um, you know carried on with the whole redemption legacy Wow. And did yeah. your dad then by that time make uh, know how to make shoes? Yeah. Um, he taught himself. Uh, and I think what also helped him, um, he worked at a footwear factory um, called Buccaneer. It was uh, here in Wellington. Yeah. And uh, Buccaneer was quite exported to Europe, etc. They made a lot of shoes. And he was like a floor manager and he learned a lot of uh, tricks of the trade. That's more mass production. Um, yeah. But he learned a lot there uh, regarding the processes. And he always tells me that um, the mass production uh, factories, he learned a lot about the processes, things he really did not want to do. If he had his own business, certain things he would do differently. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things, but uh, so that was my, mostly his own experience uh, teaching himself and then also the logistical or in the Buccaneer factory, learning a lot more about production and quality control, et cetera, on a bigger scale. Uh, so with that knowledge, he then bought the whole business and just started uh, swimming in the deep end, you know, trying to do his wow. best. Yeah. Well, this yeah. is, this is, I found this very interesting because many people I speak to, to have the story of, you know, I taught myself or I just yes. jumped into the deep end and, and did yes. it. And I think I find this also wonderful to, to, um, that, that there's so many possibilities that people don't always have to think I have to be highly educated to yes. do something that it, it, there is a, for some people, there is this process of learning by doing. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. very true. I, I think he's a prime example of that. He, he was not an academic scholar. Uh, he didn't like studying. Um, he, he will admit that. Uh, but he will always encourage young people, if you have an entrepreneurial gift or a passion, uh, you must pursue it and try to, you know, uh, improve your skills um well these days you have youtube and whatever he, he had nothing he, he really yeah. had to swim in the deep end and the thing is andre never wanted to teach him anything uh, nobody wanted to teach him anything other than um uh, so eventually when he bought the business um and he signed on the dotted line then andre said okay now you can see the tricks of the trade etc my dad uh was a bit, um, he, he always admits he's glad he paid first and yeah. then saw what he needed to do to survive. Uh, if he did it the other way around, he would have given up because it's. Really? he realized then he needs to work through the night. He needs to really grind hard to make the business survive. Um, he had no nobody helping him. <laughs> he pretty much did everything himself. Wow. Um, so it was extremely tough. I mean, he will, if he will tell you in detail uh, the nights he worked through. Uh, we were very little, obviously, um, and my mom had to support as best she can. Um, yeah, but every little cent had to be counted. Uh, you would buy your raw material, then yeah, you had debt you had to cover, etc. So it was extremely a lot of pressure, but. Um, 
I think the lesson he taught me and and uh, is just to what you mentioned about the the hard school of life. Yeah. It, it was I think the biggest lesson was to endure and to push through and to persist. Uh, too many people, I see it a lot. Uh, you just give up. It's a bit too hard. Uh, you know what? This is not for me. Um, so I think one of the biggest lesson lessons uh, was your know, persistence. Uh, yeah, persevering. And and you know, uh, it's also this thing uh, where I think it's about the dream. If one person has this yeah. dream and they believe so much in what they want to do. Uh, other people might not be have the same vision, but if it's your yes. vision, then you prepare to do the, all, make all these sacrifices to be able to do that. And this is something that is connected, I think, to artists as well and art. And I think yeah. your dad is, mm. even though he's not the artist that we think of as playing an instrument or painting, yeah. but the art of of being this entrepreneur and and yes. uh, creating, you know, creating yes. something that's very individual. Yes, I think um, you're you're right. I think from uh, I, I I saw your interviews. It's true what you mentioned. There's a lot of musicians, etc. You have your degree. You use your dream. You use your skills. Um, it comes naturally. Uh, my dad has the dream he has the skills but in a way his success was the need to survive um mm. if he did not persevere if he did not work through the night if he did not meet his targets we would have been on the street um he had to pay bills he had to supply food so he was forced to um you know work really really hard so he had the passion he had the dream uh but if he gave up on that dream uh, we would have been nowhere um so yeah. i think um he, I'm, I'm i'm constantly thinking of thomas edison you know he he wanted that yeah. light bulb he failed more than a thousand times but he wanted to create that bulb so i think my dad's almost in that frame um he had to do it otherwise we would have not made it yeah and now your business have grown so much and uh uh, you know, and this is also something you think you, nobody or nobody knows about the first stages of a business. Now you telling about all the sacrifices your dad made, and and yes. here you have this wonderful business. And uh, you were saying, how many ranges of shoes do you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so you start with obviously uh, a few styles and. Mm -hmm. You persist with that and you see how well you can make that um in the beginning years uh, uh they did a lot of carving on the leather um so you would make a basic a doll shoe they call it a doll shoe uh and you would put some carvings on it uh so that's where it basically started then a lot of sandals started to evolve uh we are very proud uh, if you look at our website redemptionleather.com there's a style called the centurion style it has many names people call it the moses sandal the jesus sandal or whatever but uh, that plaited design is something my dad developed as well um so yeah eventually we, yeah we we if you exist more than 40 years we have more than 200 styles that we've wow. developed over the years and, and the funny thing is if you've been around for a while uh so you obviously some things are not in fashion anymore and then you get clients from the 80s and the 90s and they come and they, and they show you their old style. And they're like, can you make still make this? And we're like, <laughs> yeah, of course. We don't make it anymore, but we still have the, in our archives, we still have the patterns, et cetera. So it is funny for me. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in the business to see, oh, my goodness. I remember I was 10 years old when that came out. Um, and then people sort of recall that. But uh, in the times that we are living in today, I tell my dad, sometimes I think our variety is a bit too much. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 in a way, struggle to, to uh, you know, uh, you sort of lose focus. Where am I now? What styles do they mm -hmm. want? Uh, and you still develop new ones. Um, so, yeah, I, the longer we, we, I mean, we've been around more than 40 years. So to catch up on all the designs and the old styles, 
yeah, it's quite quite a task. Yeah. So now you also then came into the business. What made you interested in this business then? Yeah, obviously my story is different. Um, I, I, my story is not a story of desire and passion and survival. Uh, I'm not obviously born into this business. And uh, so my dad was extremely careful not to force anything upon me. Um, he would not tell me you have to do this. Now I'm, I only have a sister that lives in the, in England. So I'm the um, most logic heir for the business here in Wellington. Um, so what, what I decided is when I was um, second last year, when I was 17, my dad asked, you know, you have to decide what you want to study, uh, if you want to study. And he said, you know, I'm not forcing you, but there's an option of studying um, footwear design and technology in the UK. Uh, it's quite a unique uh, course. It's two years uh, diploma. And uh, my train of thinking was, you know, uh, uh, even though it might not be as a great passion for me as my dad, it is a wonderful business. Um, he, he, there's a lot of things already in place. Um, for me to study two years abroad is a great opportunity. Um, so I did it and uh, it was in Leicester, UK, central England. Uh, I had a lot of fun uh, from 1997 to 99. Just for interest sake, it used to be called uh, Southfields College and it's now called oh. Leicester College. Uh, oh, they okay. merged. I've heard of At that. At that time when I arrived, yeah, when I arrived there, I mean, that course in the footwear trade because Leicester Northampton is very much known for footwear. At that time I arrived there, the footwear course has been around for about a hundred years already. Wow. Yeah. So it's a quite a exclusive one. And, um, I did that. So when I did that, I came back and, um, uh, the actual plan was for me to work elsewhere, uh, at a different, uh, footwear factory. Uh, it didn't work out that way. So I worked, in our factory for a number of years. Uh, I took a bit of a detour just to try. Um, that's another story, but I did music for a while. So I'm also, we all, actually my whole family is very musical. Wow. Um, play guitar, sing, etc. I did that for a number of years. Um, but through it all, I, I still did a bit of leather work um, as freelance for my dad. And uh, yeah, so I've been full time now with the business again since 2016. Okay. Yeah. And now you are, so you can also make shoes. You, you're part of the design and the, the new things that you do. Yes, of course. Yeah. Now, I, my dad, if he, he, will, he always says that uh, he's a garage shoemaker oh, okay. and I'm the college shoemaker so okay. i got trained the proper way and um, it's it's actually funny because we sometimes talk about it and uh the you the college way is a very specific uh academic way you do you mm -hmm. make patterns etc um he had to teach himself so yeah. <laughs> he has a different method but at the end we get the same result um yeah so i i we don't do a lot of new styles Frequently, we do maybe two to three new styles per annum per year. Um, uh, but mostly he would say, you know, he thinks we need to move in this direction or try this or try that. Uh, and I'll try and develop something with him. Um, yeah, so design is not uh, a big factory. So I have a full time designer. For us, mm -hmm. it's useless, really. You just do the odd design or development every now and then. Uh, so mostly what I do is um, I do make shoes, uh, a bit of it, yeah, but um, I still do a lot of uh, raw material planning because uh, uh, it's a lot of money, your raw material, and you do need to plan it well because some of it is imported. So we do need to plan uh, way ahead. Oh, I see. Okay, because yeah. I was thinking in, in Wellington there is a tannery. Do you use local mm. um, leather as well? 
Yes, you're right. Uh, Wellington had a very big tannery. Uh, it's now called the old tannery. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It's now some shops, but they they still have a, a smaller part of the tannery in central Wellington uh, called, I think they're called Mossock Tannery. Um, uh, we, we at the moment not really big clients of them, but we do buy a lot of our raw material uh, locally. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain materials you just, uh, not a lot of people that make them here. Um, so some of it we import. Um, yeah, we it's, because we're so small, we and, and with technology, you can really shop around these days. And yeah. we try to really get the best prices to, you know, obviously help our clients and, and uh, make the, the, the retail price uh, as competent as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And you make a, a shoe uh, uh, that in South Africa is known as uh, the Fally. Um, mm. That that I remember also was a very mm. uh, popular shoe. Um, do you cater uh, very much for the South African market? Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll actually I have a Fels here in front of me. I'll show you now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, just the interesting thing: the younger generation coming through now, between eighteen and thirty. They call everything Felskuna now. Um, oh, really? It's extremely confusing. They yeah. associate fella uh, skins with yeah. anything leather. So I want I some see. fella. I want some <laughs> Felskuna. Then, then it's like a fancy court shoe. I'm like, that's not a Felskun, you know? So yeah. <laughs> the young people are confusing the old Felskun. But this is a typical Felskun. Um, oh, yeah. You have the laces and then, uh, you know, you have a, a quarter and a vamp. Um, mm -hmm. And it's usually a stitch down uh, design here on the side, uh, very basic um, with some laces. Um, so yeah, we make about six different variations of a, of a felskun, mm -hmm. as you know it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the young people, as I said, they call everything a felskun. <laughs> so it's sometimes a bit confusing. <laughs> um, we give our shoes names and you say, please just stick to the name. Then we know what we what you are talking about. Oh yeah. Um, you are something else about the uh, Felskun. Um, yeah, the, the, um, for the South African market. So do you um, yes. design for this specifically for the South African market? Yes, that's a good question. We actually, uh, we are very grateful. Um, we mostly just make for South African mm. market. Um, we have so many people supporting us locally, which is awesome. Uh, we are very grateful. Many people tell us, why don't you export? Uh, especially a person like yourself, if you know our shoes and you live uh, elsewhere, oh, I want your shoes. It's a great honor for us, but um, you know, there's so many logistical problems for us uh, being so small uh, to export. So we're very grateful to sell locally um, to, our, to our people here. We obviously get a lot of tourist people um, coming to Wellington. Uh, yes, and we do a lot of courier, parcels uh, as the americans would say we ship uh, but yeah. shipping to canada or whatever is possible but uh, it's just risky you know if you need your sizing etc needs to oh, be yeah. pretty spot on um uh yeah so it, it, we have done it uh yeah one pair here one pair there but uh some people obviously want to make a bu business out of it uh, to also answer your question um we have a shop here in West at our factory which a lot of people support then we do a lot of uh, courier parcels uh, all through the country and then finally um, uh, we do have uh, what I call boutique clients you know as they would buy uh, say 30 pairs order 30 oh. pairs buy it from us and then so we do have a number of those clients as well yeah we don't just uh, sell ourselves we also you know manufacture for other boutiques yeah now and your factory you also now supply to uh, jobs for many people in in mm. uh, wellington area so how many how mm. big is your factory well factory from a factory point of view we, we're very small we have less than 20 people um uh, working for us and then in the shop there's some sales ladies so we actually we are a hundred percent handmade uh, factory, so we're very small, and we also can't be compared to a 
to a big food waste factory with a mass production setup. You know, we um, have, for instance, uh, each person would have two tables and he's responsible for making his own shoes from beginning to end, mm-hmm. barring, stitching and scouring. So um, we make every person make everything himself, you know, so uh, we're very unique in that sense. Um the plus side of that is we're very flexible. Uh, we can change our styling uh, very quickly. Um, you know, we don't have big machines and stuff that we have to recalibrate, etc. So, uh, yeah, many people are extremely amazed um, because we're so unique in a handmade sense. You know, yeah. Um, so that we try to keep it that way. There are many temptations we could have. Yeah, we could put in laser cutters, we could put in major machines, we can make the production, we can triple the production, yeah, but it it defies the purpose. We really want to stick to that niche handmade market. And that's probably another reason why export is a bit tricky for us because of our shoes being handmade. You do get the odd little flaw and character. Uh, It's not perfect, you know, so uh, a lot of European people might not understand that. because it's yeah. so different, yeah. Yeah, but this is this was your dad's idea to keep it handmade and to keep it so in Yes, yeah. Totally, yeah, and that that that's his strength, you know. Uh, yeah. He understands it. Um, yeah, and 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 that's always. I think the business started that way since 1976. Yeah. So we try to, um, you know, stick to it. And and our, our our name is Redemption Fine Handcrafted Leather. So we try to stick to that whole fine and crafted uh, process, you know, um, yeah. you do just for interest sake, you do get people making shoes, uh, saying handmade, but, uh, we know from a fact that most of the shoes are actually made by machines. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's actually insult to us to be honest, but yeah, we, yeah. we still do it the proper handmade way. You know? mm-hmm. And, um, but uh, you showed me shoes previously, um, uh, mm. lady shoes. Just uh, mm. give me an idea of what. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, once again, you can uh, have a look on our website or Instagram. We're very, yeah. very proud of our Instagram page, uh, redemptionleather.sa, I think. Um, we put a lot of photos on there of our latest styles, etc. Um, but yeah, this is a, a flip flop uh, sandal called the Rio. Um, so we oh, make it in funky that. colors. This is red and turquoise. Um, we put some foam in the insole. Uh, I use a very good lining um, that you know can stand up well and it's very strong. Uh, also, this is my idea. Just try to fold it uh, that there's not a lot of stitching and stuff that to annoy your toes. So it's just folded there. Um, so that works well. And then um, one more example is this is old espadrille, espadrille style. Um, it's a standard style, but we put some butterfly holes in them, you know, wow. uh, yeah. just as it makes it look a bit different. Um, we use leather insoles. Um, uh, this is not lined, but if we use lining, it's leather lining as well. It's very healthy. It absorbs your sweat. Um, the nice English word, it's permeable. So it has the ability to breathe. It can actually in the summer, you can wear it without socks. It, uh, it breathes, it actually insulates your feet. Uh, it makes it cool in the summer, warm in the winter. Uh, it's a natural product. It, it's leather, it's a skin, it breathes. So we're very strict. Uh, we only use uh, leather, um, leather insoles, leather lining. Obviously soling is more rubber, but uh, yeah. yeah. So we're very proud of, of that as well. We don't use synthetics. That's wonderful. Oh, I love that, really. Mm, thank uh, you. But um, um, tell me, Nick, now, uh, what is your wish for the future? Wow, uh, there are so many possibilities. I think because um, we are so flexible, Phew, we can we can move into many directions. Uh, but I think my challenge is to stick to the handmade recipe, you know, mm. um, it, that's what makes us unique you know I, just for interest sake uh the sooner or as soon as we go into a mass production mentality we start to compete with the big guys like china etc and we will never survive you know it's 
different level of shoemaking that. So we try to stick to our lane. And I think for future uh, challenge, challenges for myself, I'd like to stick to that lane. Um, there are ways you can make it a bit more exciting, um, more colorful, um, more trendy. Um, technology these days changing a lot. So there, there are ways you can use technology uh, you know, for, for your advantage. So yeah, I, I, I have one or two ideas, but I don't want to t think too far ahead. Um, many people say my generation would be the expansion generation. To be honest, uh, <laughs> we have enough challenges. So the yeah. size we have is, is great. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, we try to keep it small and manageable. Uh, the sooner we go bigger, the more people you need to employ, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so I, I don't try to think too far ahead, but we have a recipe that works. Uh, so it's just juggling around, playing around with it to uh, ensure that um, we satisfy our customers. Well, I love it. And I, I really hope that you stay as authentic as you are because i think this is in this time also so important that we think back to this these this handmade you know this and giving people this uh, pride of what they've made uh, even the yes. workers that you have there and yes. giving people this opportunity and that it doesn't all become just factory made and and yes. lose that individuality so i would yeah. really uh if if this is your wish to stay, that I will wish that for with you. <laughs> you thank know, you. that you stay as as authentic, authentic. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Being authentic and Monday on Mondays, I have um, a meeting with my factory guys, and I always tell them, you know, um, we put a little stamp uh, on the insole, uh, so I I know which guy made the shoe. So I tell him, listen. We supply the raw material, we supply the orders, but um, you yourself, you have to take responsibility for your product. You make it from scratch to the end and you have to take pride in what you make. And if you make it well, people will buy your shoes, people will wear it. And you as a laborer can feel proud of that, you know? So okay. I constantly have to motivate them in such a way um, to make it real for them. Um, yeah, but it, it's very unique in that sense that, like you said, it's very authentic. Uh, you, you're, you're, you make it from scratch and it's your product that needs to sell. So I try to give him, uh, my dad's very uh, uh, passionate about giving a person responsibility um, and taking responsibility and owning up to your product, you know. So we have a, a very good product system as well. If, there's a, if you have a problem with your shoes, uh, you know, especially soling mid problems, whatever we can obviously take good care of it. We can resole, we can fix the glue, we can, and uh, I, I, I know I can give it back to the person that made it to fix his mistake. So they know they have to make it well so that they don't get um, shoes to return, you know. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of pride in what we do. Uh, we can always improve, always. Uh, mm -hmm. We always try to improve. Um, you get 10 people that are happy and then one that's not happy. And then you're very sad because of that one person. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it's you have to look like at that. the successes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. be happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, I, I still have the, the fellies that I bought my daughter, I think, in 1996 or seven. Uh, wow. I keep those fellies, yeah, because you make you make for children as well. We do, yes, yeah. we do. We have a bit of kiddies. Uh, we don't spend a lot of energy on them. We have about three, four kiddie styles. We yeah. have a lot of lady styles, and also the men. We have uh, spend a bit of time on them, but mostly on the ladies. Uh, we find that uh, we have a lot of uh, female clients. Um, so, and just for interest sake, we also do leather belts. We do make our own handbags as well. So uh, sometimes we make leather hats. Uh, so it's not just shoes. We do manufacture yeah. other leather products as well. Amazing. Well, I'm going to put your the website link uh, in the description. And then whoever visits South Africa, uh, 
again can come and visit Redemption Shoes. Thank Redemption, you. what Thank uh, you. what do you call it? Uh, yes, Redemption. no, mostly mostly people just call it Redemption. So mm -hmm. in Wellington, it's so easy because it's one of the biggest uh, tourist attractions in our town. So uh, you can easily find it on maps. Um, Yes, we just call it Redemption, but the full name is Redemption Fine Handcrafted Leather. And the actual website is www.redemptionleather.com. Okay. And uh, you're on Instagram and Facebook as well. Yes. Uh, the Facebook, yeah. um, I, um, I, I try to steer away from that. There is a page for us, but I, I don't put stuff on that. Okay. Uh, uh, we don't have a big admin stuff you know to to manage yeah. that but um the instagram we try to do as frequently as possible my mom's quite good at that now um okay. she does a lot of the styling and the photos etc uh so that is let me just double check here um i don't want to get it wrong um it's redemption leather dot sa okay yeah I'll, redemption I'm leather dot sa i'll put that also in the description <laughs> thank you yeah no. I, I think the instagram is probably for the more modern people yeah. we try to put a lot of photos on there and, and information so you you'd get a good idea and then the actual website is great for if you want to mail and order uh yeah. we try to do all our orders through the website okay now, Nick, uh, I have one last question for you. Can you do a mm. shout out for a restaurant or a, uh, even a, you can do a shout out for a winery because there's a lot of wineries mm. there, but uh, can you do a shout mm. out for, an, for a restaurant or coffee shop in your area? Wow, yes. Um, I must think now, because if I say the wrong one, I'll be in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me think nearby uh a lot of people come here to enjoy the view because i'm surrounded by vineyards um yeah. so a lot of people go to val de charon uh, val du charon is french mm -hmm. it used to be a name they used for wellington long time ago mm -hmm. um they have a pizza restaurant a steak restaurant and then uh they make their own wines uh there's also opposite them or nearby is called dunstan uh, they have a coffee shop called Stone Kitchen. Then in town in Wellington is Perfect Place. They've been around a long time. So I'll use those three at first yeah. you know, as a shout out. Okay. I'll put their uh, websites also on the on the description. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And then wineries, I just want to mention the Bosman uh, Winery. Uh, yeah. they are, they've been around for ages um, in this valley. Uh, I'm also quite a big fan of Duelhof, um, which is uh, also nearby. And then uh, my dad's big school friend is called Skulk Berger, played big rugby. His son also played for the Springboks, yeah. and he's called Velbedacht Wines. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I'll put them all on. Yeah, I'll put all Thank the... <laughs> That's great. They, they will enjoy that. <laughs> oh, okay. But Thank Nick... You. This was so lovely to talk to you, and uh, I'm definitely coming to to get my felt schooner uh, at Redemption again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, when and, I and you bring to... bring those 1996 models as well. We'll put new soles on them. Oh, okay, okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so have a lovely um, uh, afternoon. Thank you. You and too. I, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you for the interview and thank you for asking easy questions. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and send my regards to your dad. He's he's very proud of you, he said. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud of him as well. His name's Arnold. Uh, he always teases. He says he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he'll he's a back. lovely guy. Yeah, he'll, he'll be, be back. back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, Nick. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.